I want to thank everyone for coming. And a uh, tremendous crowd. And we have an unusual, outstanding young gentleman that uh, is our honor uh, guest in the spirit of education, which is the main part of our forum. Before we start, I, it's important that we know who are we? Right, David? Yes. Who are we? We're the Collin County Traditional Conservative Men's Club, correct? We have 40 years experience in the county of helping candidates. Look who's coming in, Kay Bears. Mm -hmm. All right? <coughs> we, we need to all stand up and support <laughs> them. <laughs> Let's do it. Really. You're really uh, American. Uh, Let's do that. Let's all stand, stand up. Stand up and the And give her a line call. All right? Look who's coming in the door. Come on. Hey! children, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, whatever, we're going to have to have about 20 people to help us distribute the flags on the 4th of July. <coughs> Number two, we will assemble the float 
and that read it here on the third Thursday night at headquarters. And then we start to pray it across the street. So pass that around. Window, you got it going? It's going. Okay. And if you can help us, and uh, walk is the main thing, and distribute the flags, garden, that's okay. I'm going to get you a bicycle. Right. <laughs> you decide what I'm doing. Phyllis is going to be on the float. All right. Uh, Commissioner uh, Phyllis Cole. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, let's talk about our speaker. I have to tell you a little story. Uh, I was uh, called uh, Colonel Poole and, uh, with the uh, purpose of going and uh, request that he would come and speak to our group. And uh, he said, well, hello, Richard. He said, uh, I'm flying in from Dubai, Dubai tomorrow, and we'll grab some chow and you tell me about it. And I said, well, are you flying Southwestern? I mean, uh, I know uh, uh, of Dubai. Is that out close from San Antonio or is that out around El Paso? <laughs> he said, I'll tell you, Richard, don't worry about it. I'll bring you a globe when we get together. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a little lesson in geography. <laughs> I'm humbled. I'm going to do one other thing. Just had a thought. But everyone that served this magnificent country of ours in the in uniform, please stand. I know you're proud. <laughs> Colonel Poole retired from the Marine Corps with 31 years of service. He was deployed in Korea, Central America, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, 1991 two tours in Iraq, 2004 and 2005, and they called him back up for the surge in 2006 and 2007. He's received 42 personal awards and citations, including the Legion of Merit and three Bronze Stars. When he retired from the Marines, then go back to the Marines, he went to work for KBR, which is a security forum, and you were uh, became the managing director of security for the State Department and the Department of Defense over Iraq, Iran, and Syria. Okay. Uh, after leaving as managing director for KBR, you became involved with Silicon Global Security. <coughs> and uh, in that line, his team actually constructed the embassy in Tel Aviv. That's one of them. But he provided the security for, again, the U.S. embassies, and uh, all the defense, Department of State, Department of Defense, and Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia. Okay. He now lives in Anna, Texas, part of Collin County. He has his lovely wife, Ruth. She likes horses, right? Mm -hmm. And they have two children and four grandchildren. Wow. And uh, I'll, let's give him a round of applause for you. <laughs> and he's going to discuss now. Four points from ISIS, okay, and uh, also the peace efforts going on. So, sir, the program is yours. Right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much for having us this evening. Ruth and I were really looking forward to this, and uh, it is a real privilege to be here. I, I've had a lot of fun meeting uh, a lot of folks already this evening. I haven't met you. I want to meet you before I leave here this evening, though, please. And I'm hoping that this is going to cooperate with me. I pointed at the Again, just thanks for having us. Ruth and I are thrilled to be here. We've got a lot to talk about tonight, so uh, I'm going to go pretty quick. I've got a lot of slides. I've got a lot of information, but I want to leave some time at the end so we can just have some discussion. But if there's something that you want to talk about while we're in the middle of this, let's just talk about it. Don't, don't feel like you've got to wait till the end or something. Just say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. <laughs> I, want to, I want to explore that a little bit with you. And, and I'll be happy to do that. So please feel free for a given take. Um, so, part of the topic was the difference between Al Qaeda, ISIS, and the Taliban. And I've got uh, a lot of information to share with you on all three of us. But one thing you need to know is they compete with each other. Not so much the Taliban, but ISIS and Al Qaeda are, are very much at odds with one another. Al Qaeda splintered out of, or ISIS splintered out of Al Qaeda, so there's, there's no love lost there between those. So I found this cartoon of, you know, we're the, we're the best. You know, you guys are the infidels. No, we're not. Uh, yeah, you are. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of the typical thing that they do. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, very much, uh, uh, they fight against each other. They kill each other. So both lay claim to being uh, the, the legitimate 
uh, terrorists, if you will. <laughs> and, and what, a, what a title of claim. <laughs> President Trump, I think, said it best. He said, this is not a battle between different faiths. Our tackling of ISIS, he said, different sects or different civilizations. He said, this is a battle between barbaric criminals who seek to obliterate human life and decent people, all in the name of a religion. And people want to protect their religion. This is a battle really between good and evil. And I'm going to repeat that several times, and I think as you see us go through some of this, you're going to realize that this truly is a battle of good and evil. These, these upstanding citizens are three of the, the most wanted right now. It's kind of a cobbled together slide, but Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, as you know, is the leader of ISIS. He's on the lam right now. We think that he's somewhere <coughs> probably uh, right along the border area between Syria uh, and Iraq. You'll see maps in a few minutes. I'm going to show you where the holdouts, the, the last hardcore holdouts of, our, of ISIS are, are, are located. Ayman al Zawahiri is the second most wanted on the FBI list. Uh, he engineered the bombings in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi. Uh, he was one of the masterminds on 9 11 along with Osama bin Laden. Uh, he is a, a pretty twisted character. But he's been running Al Qaeda ever since we killed Osama bin Laden uh, in 2011. So he's and he's hidden out. We believe he's probably laying low in Pakistan somewhere. Um, so, but, but the ongoing uh, the ongoing search for these guys is still underway. Malawi uh, Hibatullah Akunzada uh, is the head of the Taliban. And the Taliban, let me just give you a real quick run out of the Taliban. So, where did the Taliban come from? When, when the Russians left uh, with their tails more or less between their legs uh, from Afghanistan, the government also crumbled, the Afghan government. So there were a group of students, Afghan students, that were in <coughs> Afghanistan that came in in about 96 and said, let's stand up a government. And, and Mullah Omar, Muhammad Omar, joined in with them. He became the de facto leader of the Taliban at that time, and they set up a government. The government was based on uh, Sharia law, on Islamic law, uh, and some tribal rules and laws that were local to the, to the Pashtun and other uh, sects within the society of Afghanistan. So it's kind of a cobbled together, uh, marked simply by severity. Uh, zero tolerance, incredibly severe, very oppressive, uh, especially to women, to any other, uh, to the to youth, to almost intolerant of, of anything other than just worship of the Quran. Um, so he died in 2013, was succeeded by Mullah Akhtar Mansur, uh, who was the drug lord for the Taliban. You know, there's a lot of poppies in the Taliban. <coughs> so he was the he was the opium guy, made a lot of money for the Taliban. Uh, and we killed him with a, with a drone in 2016. I saw somebody's going to talk about drones here in one of your future meetings. So this guy now has taken over, and uh, we believe he pretty much operates out of Pakistan as well. So these guys, I, I got some really eye-opening news for you about the Taliban. Uh, so let's move on. I don't want to miss any of this. Uh, we think that he's either between, uh, is either in uh, somewhere around Kandahar or, or actually over the border in, uh, in Pakistan. At the beginning of this month, uh, ISIS seized over 40%, or by 2015, ISIS had seized over 40% of Iraq and almost 30% of Syria. Now, uh, to kind of isolate them, all of ISIS is now sort of in a pocket right here on the <laughs> Syrian border. So they're out of Mosul, they're, they're no threat to Baghdad. Most of the Baghdad bombings have stopped. Uh, today they have lost 99% of the real estate that they had back as late as 2000, beginning of 2017. Uh, the coalition forces uh, liberated over 100 towns and villages, and of course Mosul and Fallujah. Uh, and these were major cities. Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq. Fallujah is also a very large city. Well, what happens in these cities when these terrorists take over uh, is most of your citizens pack up, take their entire families, they move out in the middle of the deserts, and they survive. In these cases with ISIS, uh, much different than Al-Qaeda, and one of the big differences in ISIS and Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda believes that we need 
the, the Muslim population, to all of them, to support us, to believe in us, to hide us, to make us feasible, make us, make us effective. ISIS believes anybody, anybody that does not join ISIS has got to be killed. No one in the history of the Arab world has killed as many Muslims as ISIS. And we'll talk about numbers in a few minutes on how many people have been displaced and how many refugees and some of the crimes that they've committed. You've seen a lot of it on the news, but I, I just want to I just want to kind of bring you some detail about it. Um, so very small triangle territory right on the border. Uh, we're mobilizing right now. The Iraqi army has mobilized all along their border on about a 30-mile front to encircle these guys. The Syrian Democratic forces have moved down and cut them off from Syria. French special forces are in there with the Iraqi army. Uh, so these guys' days are numbered. There's only a few hundred of them left in there. But we believe that they'll fight to the finish. They'll fight to the very last. Uh, and by the way, this year has been marked by many ISIS fighters that became disenchanted, which, you know, 25,000 sorties of airstrikes will disenchant you. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them wanted out of there. They don't want to, they just, they're like, you don't want to get pounded, pasted out here. We've got to get out of here. And so ISIS began killing their own in, in wholesale fashion, killing dozens and even hundreds of their own. So no conscience with these folks. All my daddy is somewhere in that little pocket holding out. Uh, as early as last week, uh, one, of our, one of our folks caught one of the five top ISIS leaders. In fact, he was the finance guy. He had his laptop with him, the cell phone with him. And of course, they, they peeled those things back. And they persuaded four of the other leaders. And they were trying to get out of Baghdadi, too. But the next four top guys in all of ISIS came over into Iraq for a meeting. And they all got snagged up right there. They backed them all up. They got them all. So there is nobody in ISIS that we don't know right now. Name, height, weight, shoe size. <laughs> they pretty much they pretty much believe the information that they've got out of them. But they're going to be taking down these guys in the very near future. Just to kind of give you an idea of the base of operations of Al Qaeda, uh, ISIS. You see, they're they they're especially Al Qaeda is on a worldwide uh, effort, and ISIS was well there too. The red as you see is Al Qaeda and ISIS, so they're competing in Afghanistan, and Syria, Libya, Niger, and Nigeria. There's a lot of <coughs> other homegrown terrorist groups that, had, that back in 15 and 16 uh, rushed to affiliate themselves with ISIS. They kind of wish they hadn't done that now, but there's, there's very few people there that they affiliated with. So uh, ISIS is about to be extinct, but, but they had a pretty wide footprint at that point in time. Uh, this was the dream that al Baghdadi had for his great caliphate, which would have included, you know, literally about 70% of Iraq, almost all of Syria. But you see, the, 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 the border comes down here below Baghdad. So they were full intent on taking Baghdad back in 15 and 16. Uh, what about the south down here? Uh, we're going to kind of plunge into that if you miss the white southern Iraq. Well, Hezbollah is the, the dominant terrorist power in southern Iraq and Basra in that area. That also happens to be where uh, three or four of the largest supergiant oil fields are located. So, you know, why uh, ISIS didn't move on down into southern Iraq raises a good question. Uh, why uh, ISIS wouldn't push down there? Why uh, Hezbollah, who's, who is simply a proxy, we're going to talk about that, a proxy of Iran. We're going we're to peel the onion back on all these guys here this evening. Uh, if we have time, but um, there's there's quite a lot of people that are in these terrorist organizations, and they have loose affiliations, or they fight to, to the death with each other. This was the heyday. Uh, call this 2016. The shaded area, the striped area, was the actual compared to kind of get an idea of, of what he dreamed of, and then what he got. Uh, it was merely a fraction. So, but this this JV team. Move fast, if you remember. Yeah. At 14, they were kind of JV. You know, don't mess with them. You know, they're going to go fizzle out in no time. Well, they threatened to take over Iraq and Syria. I mean, they made a real, they made a real plunge at it. And, and the unfortunate thing is, in that process, in those several years that they grew up and they and they did their best, and they're at their heyday, and now they're down to a few hundred people. They killed hundreds of thousands. 
hundreds of thousands. The recruiting method was the typical gun to do. <coughs> are you with us or are you against us? And a guy told me, because I asked him, Iraqi generals years ago when I was working closely with him back in 2004, he asked, well, why did you guys stand up against Saddam Hussein? What an evil character. Why wouldn't you just throw off the yoke of that crazy, loony dictator? I said, we can't. We couldn't. So it wasn't that he would just punish you. He rounded up all your family and your extended family and took them out in the desert too. And they were put in common graves. Those 450, 500,000 people buried out in the desert, I saw those dug up graves out north of Baghdad. They were real. They were out there. Once he was deposed uh, and, and on the land, and of course you know we found him and they hung him. But they went out and excavated those areas and hundreds of thousands of families poured out there to try to find him. You know, some remains of their loved ones. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands of citizens. So they came from all over Iraq, not just Baghdad. The, by the way, the, the interesting how things shifted in 2017, 2017, about the last 15 months, we dropped more bombs on ISIS than we dropped in the three previous years collectively. So half the time, more than double the number of airstrikes and bombs. So the, the, the gloves came off. And that's why ISIS is all but extinct. Uh, Department of Defense estimates that over 40,000 ISIS killers have been, uh, fighters have been killed. Um, that, that was a pretty good number at one time. And a lot of those guys didn't sign up out of choice. You know, they were, they were press gang, so to speak. Uh, just to give you an idea of how complicated and complex this, this <coughs> field of terrorism is, these terror organizations, you see Boko Haram here, you know, from, from Africa, you've got Al-Shabaab up in Somalia, you've got Al-Qaeda and ISIS in between. Some that are even on the street are in you know, Hamas and Hezbollah. I mean, there's plenty of type of terrorist groups that aren't even mentioned up here. It's kind of give you a, an idea of the dividing lines, if you will. And I'm going to make these slides available if y'all want them or anything. I'm going to, we'll, we'll copy them off. You're welcome to have them. My notes included. Uh, and I'll, I'll stress my notes are not official, so my attribution is purely me. Okay, so if you, and I have no, uh, <clears throat> no uh, reservation about attribution, so if you want to say, I kind of said this, you know, and I don't know, if someone else says, I got a different view of it, that's, you know, it's probably from their perspective and their vantage point. So, uh, Taliban uh, in Afghanistan, I tell you, there's a lot of change going on with the Taliban right now. In the past three months, literally thousands of mullahs, imams, religious scholars, and teachers have formed a coalition to pressure the Taliban to seek a peaceful solution. And, and, and literally, they had a ceasefire last weekend for Eid, which is the, the, the finish of uh, Ramadan. So there was a ceasefire. That never happened in 17 years. There had never been a ceasefire agreed upon or negotiated in the past 17 years. So I think we're starting finally to make some <coughs> progress here. Uh, and it's going to be just a matter of, of trying to get um, you know, the Ashraf Ghani's government uh, and the, the tribal leaders and the Taliban leaders to somehow come to some kind of coalition. You've got to have inclusion, you've got to have coalition, you've got to have some negotiating points. So, you know, I think they're getting closer than they have in the last 17 years. So I'm hopeful. I think we've got some positive things happening there. I don't want to forget these guys. I, I got to tell you, uh, Iran is, is probably, uh, right now, it's the only world's state sponsor of organized terrorism. Finance it, own it, their official proxies, uh, they're sent in wherever. Both of them are now over in the West Bank. They're both in, 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 in within Palestine and, and create lots of problems for the Israelis. Since January this year, <coughs> Shin Bet has stopped, the Israeli intelligence service has stopped, foiled over 250 terror attacks. What's this? Middle June? Mm -hmm. Less than six months? How's that divide out? That's, that's more than one a day. One a day. But I'll tell you, the bad news is, is Iran has pipelined massive amounts of funding. You know, they, they came into a lot of cash here a while back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, 
a lot of that went into the terrorist organizations. And we went straight to them. And I tell you, uh, I personally had a major heartburn with Iran. I would tell you, during 2004, 5, 6, 7, eight, during my time in Iraq, and I lost two dear friends, two brothers, mm. to the IEDs and the EAPs, the explosively formed projectile, it looks like a, a, a molten piece of, of copper that fires and can go right through it in one Abrams tank. Whoa. And you wouldn't believe what it does to a car, like one of our vehicles out here in the parking lot. Kills everybody in the car. It's a shape charge goes in and it falls, and so all the metal in the thing starts flying around. The car becomes shrapnel. The vehicle becomes the truck, the Humvee. Oh they killed hundreds and hundreds of Americans. And I have seen the rockets in someone's backyard in the neighborhoods around the green zone uh, that were captured with, with uh, uranium markings on them. And, and most of them were brought in over the border straight in there on, on pack mules. You know, they were just towed into Baghdad. Mortar rounds, rockets, of all, uh, all, all sizes, I mean, 122s, 107s, the, the big ones, you know, the, the 220s that can just take out a whole city block. Um, <clears throat> they almost hit our bill with one in 2014. We haven't had a rocket shot at us in, uh, since 2011 when the last soldier in the last MRAP crossed the border into Kuwait. I'm going to come back and talk about that in just a minute because that's a big part of our problem in the Middle East. Uh, it's been a big part of the price paid in the last three years for that campaign promise fulfilled. You follow me on that? Mm -hmm. It was <clears throat> unconscionable to abandon Iraq completely, take every soldier out of there, when we had troops in Jordan, we had troops in Turkey, we had troops in Saudi Arabia, we had troops in Kuwait, we had troops in Korea, we had troops in Japan, we had troops in Germany. But we took every last soldier out of Iraq and ISIS happened. If there had been one brigade, and, and I, would, I would debate this with uh, anybody, uh, one brigade of soldiers would have prevented ISIS. One brigade, 5,000 guys, 4,000 guys would have never happened. Might have happened in Syria, but it wouldn't have happened in Iraq. I'm going to clip along, y'all. I Pardon me this. I can't help it. I, I come back and I start relating these guys. They're as heinous as Adolf Hitler and the scheme of Nazism was. You know, it's a genocide uh, organization. All these guys. I don't differentiate any. Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas. Uh, they're all equally evil. And, and they've all got to be eradicated. I mean, these guys are a cancer on the countries that they operate in. But the question, I guess, comes, well, where, did, where did ISIS come from? I can, I can tell you that the lion's share of them came after the Arab Spring. They started migrating into Syria and Iraq. Now, what was the Arab Spring? Y'all remember that in, in 2011, 12? <laughs> why, why did the Arab Spring even happen? I can tell you, sometime, Richard, we've got to do a deal with nothing but the Arab Spring and just talk about that, because there's... There's a lot to it. Uh, but virtually uh, all of the Middle East countries uh, rebelled. And, and what they did is the, most of these countries were formed after World War I. You know that. Uh, 1918, you know, most of them were formed and the rest, you know, in the 30s and even the 40s. Uh, and they had Adirs and they had Shahs and they had uh, kings and they had mullahs. And they, had, they all had some kind of authoritarian dictatorial rule. And, and I think, now I, I would, I would just, I'd love to discuss this with someone that has a different view, but I think what happened, y'all, is we had the 2005 January elections in Iraq, and then we had the 2010 elections for, for the entire parliament and the prime minister, and, and all the media worldwide showed all those thousands and thousands of Iraqi citizens mm -hmm. with that blue finger. You remember that? Mm -hmm. and, and, there's, and the rest of the Middle East looked and said, well, what about us? Well, why not us? We got a guy, you know, Muammar Gaddafi. You know, he's about as bad as as Saddam Hussein was. Let's boot him out. Virtually every country had some level of. Now, and I got to add, I don't mean I don't mean to be negative. You know, I'm, I'm kind of an eternal optimist, aren't I? I'm not a pessimist. But I'm telling you something. Our State Department was asleep at the wheel during the Arab Spring, 2011, 2012, 2013. They had no clue what was going on. They didn't know which country was going to uh, rebel, stand up next. They didn't know what to do about it, other than hunker down and see what happens. 
So, so is, that, Chief, is that a comment also on 9-11? You know, I, I don't know about 9-11. I, I think 9-11 I think was our underestimation of an, an opposition, a foe that was, that was growing and growing uh, in Afghanistan, and we just did not have enough people focused on it. We, we, had a, we had a little bit of confusion, I think, going on in our circles because we had gone in and we had helped the Mujahideen get rid of the Russians, right? Yeah. So we helped arm them, we helped train them, we helped, we did everything we could. But we didn't really see, and Al Qaeda was fighting the Russians. I mean, they were the base, the base Al Qaeda, the base, was joined with the Taliban. They were sister organizations. And Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden and Al-Azam here were all teamed up, let's get rid of the Russians. That was the thing, is let's liberate Afghanistan and then get our, get our Taliban rule installed. And so, you know, when they were liberated, again, we didn't have a lot to do. Remember, the Taliban took over in 1996, and we kind of watched it happen. We watched this intolerant, again, another form of dictatorship. It was, it's, it's a... Um, uh, it was our cast to be a religious dictatorship, but it was a dictatorship that took over extremely brutal. But we didn't do anything about it until we got a Pearl Harbor event on 9-11. And then, if you recall, uh, by the end of 2001, and I was mobilized immediately, we went to, you know, depending on where we were hunkered down, playing an enduring freedom, uh, and special forces. When there's some movie came out a while back, 12 strong. I don't know if you ever saw it. Mm -hmm. It's it is it is fighting from the opening of the to the closing credits. I mean, those four guys were hooking and jabbing that dozen guys with the Northern Alliance, but they toppled that Taliban government for three weeks with about 75 casualties all total in our coalition forces. And all 12 came home. And all 12 came home of our special operators, our, mm -hmm. our cavalry, our yeah. cavalrymen. Yeah, all came home. But, you know, it's, we just can't afford to take our eyes off the ball anywhere. You saw all those countries that, that have their own brand of Al-Qaeda, their own brand of ISIS. And ISIS, I'm talking about 200 guys that are held up, but ISIS is still a lot of different places. And I'll talk about that in just a second or two. But one uh, thing, excuse me, I have one yes, question. You bet. Before 9-11, who was nurturing Northern Alliance? Well, that's have a good question. The, the Northern Alliance was given a role in the new Afghan coalition government. It was right. a very minor role, and and they were then they became very alienated. That's true. So but who was nurturing them before 9/11? Before 9/11, yeah. I don't know that we were that aware. They probably had a couple of specialists, you know, in CIA that knew who they were, and and someone had the bright idea: let's go in and let's let's fight with the locals. Let's help them win back their country, which I think was brilliant. You know, rather than having you know, divisions of Marines hit the beach, you know, and uh, come swarming in, you know, airborne comes parachuting in and all that, because it would be pretty ugly, I would think. But the Northern Alliance was the one force that could get a lot of the Taliban to to cross over. That's right. And so that's that was that's always the idea is to try to find the, the local friendly, you know, who's the good guy, and and get as many people to come over and join them as possible. Because not a lot of people want to live in these intolerant societies. They don't want to be brutalized. They don't want their family brutalized. They don't want their, their little girls to go to school. They want their wives to be able to have a job or a career if they want to. All of, none of that was allowed under the Taliban. None of that. No music, no, no movie pictures, no TV, no. I mean, it was, it was uh, about as brutal as it hit. I'm not going to dwell a lot on the Arab Spring, but I would just tell you that I think that we did not have our eye on the ball, and we did not do the region any justice during that those periods uh, because a lot could have affected change. Egypt, you know, wound up with a democracy. They had a second, uh, the Islamic Brotherhood swooped in, took over, and they had to have a second revolution. They had two revolutions back to back. Uh, Tunisia now uh, has a democracy that's struggling and trying to get going. A lot of these others were just compressed. A lot of them just had a vacuum because they had no one there to help guide the transition. So. Islamic Brotherhood, Al Qaeda, ISIS, they're expert at moving into the vacuum. That's exactly what they did in Syria. They moved into the vacuum when the when the Democratic Front prevailed. 
So the military department 18, so when I was there, I watched this and watched the last ten of these leave and thought, oh boy. But the deputy commander of the multinational force got me to, about a week before this day, said, Kim, you need to come get the full upgrade. I said, sir, I've had it. He said, you're not staying, are you? And I said, yes, you know, State Department's sticking around. We're staying. We, we, we're committed to them. We're going to stay here. We're going we're to support them. We had 17 different sites across Iraq, not just that bad. And he said, they're going to be coming over the walls in the green zone. They're going to be swarming all your bases. And the good news is that that didn't happen. It didn't happen. In fact, we got rocketed or mortared every single day in 2008, 9, 10, 11. But when the last vehicle left, it stopped. Hmm. Now, I can tie some political things together for you for that, but I won't, I won't get off on that rabbit trail. But it, it, there's some interesting uh, reasons for that. But it was it was a promise fulfilled. It was under extreme pressure by the Sauter Army, the Tadal Sauter and the, the Mahdi Army. Uh, who also was expert at the indirect fire mortars and rockets, provided again by Iran in large part. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was actually part of the operation, Operation New Dawn. Yes. Coming out of there to uh, to that area. But also, I remember when we left, things did get tense in that area. But yes. I remember they said there was a storm as well because I went to that also. Yes. Um, when we left there, that was a big problem. We have to avoid there that. We know what happened after that. So, so when we when we were had the ceasefire, <laughs> my buddies and I we were, we were the second division. We were raced back down to Al Jamal. We were so excited. We were seeing, you know, hearing about parades and stuff. <laughs> we get back for the parade. You know, we didn't have any parades in Vietnam, so we wanted to get back and make a parade. But we're thinking, oh, I'm going to be old. I'm going to get there. You know, we're going to miss the parades. And we and they said, no, turn around. I got to go back up to uh, Kuwait City because the Emirs afraid there might be a uh, rebellion, and so he wants. He wants a couple of battalion Marines to stick around up there and camp outside the city and keep the peace. And so we went back there and laid around outside. I mean, we tried to train, you know, in 125 degrees, but uh, it was, we, at any rate, we, we got back, we still had the Marines in, in May and June. They weren't all over in March. <laughs> so when did you get back? Oh, that was, uh, I got back around Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. that's, that's good. That's, that was an operation we You were in a serious heat again. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but the, the, the results of that was this. Would not have happened if we had had one brigade, the smallest American presence in any country that we provide a presence in the world, this would not have happened. Hmm. Wouldn't have ever gotten off the ground. Small group of these guys did a, a jailbreak uh, in, in January, February of, no, sorry, December of, of 12. And they went out to the grave, and, and that's where Al Baghdadi was busted out. He had actually spent time in Bukha back in the early days down south in Basra uh, and was up in Abu Ghraib. But they pulled out hundreds of guys that were automatically you know, given, their, given their sheets and their, and their black outfits and their, and their, and their spook masks. To uh, start trying to, you know, get PR the world around. So we learned a lot, I think, and we got really good at developing um, coalitions. And and our coalition that was put together against ISIS, 75 countries. And I got to tell you, our our Secretary of Defense, I'm, I'm really a big fan of. Of James Mattis, uh, but he said, you know, it's burden sharing. We need, with the rest of the world, the rest of NATO, the rest of the UN, we've got to have financial burden sharing, we've got to have manpower burden sharing, and I got to tell you, we've had it here. We've had it in, in uh, uh, our, our entire campaign against ISIS. Yes, sir. How does Sweden participate when they're a neutral country? You know, they have provided funding and they provided, uh, in many cases, food stuffs. So, the, you know, everybody has a little bit of, of different type. Not everybody's got troops on the ground by any means. In fact, that's a pretty limited group that actually have trigger pullers out there. So, so but a lot of these countries are, you know, they're, they, they were going to join up, sign up, and sign that UN resolution and say, we need to eradicate this ISIS and, and all forms of terrorism. So it was, a, it was an incredibly successful uh, coalition development to fight ISIS. It's been hugely successful. Here's some of the results of ISIS. This is Mosul. 
after, after it was liberated. And it didn't look like that before I just moved in, take a word for it. But I mean, that, that rivals anything we've seen in 1945 in Nazi Germany that was firebombed for months and months. That's what they left to the people. Um, and there were hundreds of thousands of people now trying to move back in. Their homes are gone. Their business is gone. They're trying to put life back together. Prime Minister Al-Badi has been there. He's made the commitment. They're actually doing rebuilding now, cleaning up all this rubble. Uh, very, very committed with the Iraqi resources and the government. Especially with the price of oil coming, they got a little bit of money to work with. They can find it. But just some of the results, the, just the humanitarian crisis that we had uh, with, in northern Iraq and with Syria. And you've seen the news. You've seen all the people uh, just trying to get over to Greece or something. You know, overloading boats and people floating ashore and children and everything else just trying to get out of there. Just Christians especially in the cities just trying to get out of the country. Just trying to survive. They didn't have any hopes of going back and getting their house again. They thought, oh, life's got to start over somewhere else. So, so why and how did this happen? How did Iraq get caught uh, literally uh, barehanded? Well, the current security situation in Iraq, you just want to be aware, it is a defense force. What we've left behind there is not an offense force. It's a defense force. 40,000 national police through the entire country. And the, all the police in the country are national police. But they're, they're well equipped. Uh, 271,000 complete military. That includes border guards. That includes their Navy, their Air Force, uh, all of them. Their uh, equipment is extremely limited. They have 357 tanks. Those aren't all M1 Abrams. A lot of those are still old Russian T-72s and T-80s. Uh, four helicopter, fighter uh, helicopters, uh, 107 transport helicopters. We got more than this. We got 23 F-16s on the ground in northern Iraq and Baladir base now. Uh, 23. We got another 13 coming, uh, and they're all based at Balad. Uh, none are at Khalil, but there's some trainers at Khalil, uh, which is in southern Iraq. And can they fly them? Oh, I got to tell you, <laughs> these guys. So, so two of my dear friends. Uh, Face, he's the commander of the Air Force's son. He's a really handsome guy, looks like a movie star. That really is a good looking young guy. I don't have a picture of Face or Twitch. No, but, but those guys would fly two, three missions every single day. Every single day. And they were loaded to the gills. And, and they laid down a lot of hate on the bad guys. I mean, they dropped a lot of bombs. Again, with tens of thousands of sorties. And they, they did their share. They did their share. There were usually only two or three F-16s flying back in, at that time in, in 1617. But, uh, and they were augmented also by our night bombers. Our, our, uh, these were F-16s that, uh, that the Iraqis bought. And they also had the night bombers. You see how much armament of those things will hold. Uh, Cessna actually built these things to be mail planes. <coughs> they were designed to be, they make a great little night bomber. You do not want to fly them during the daytime. I had two dear friends. <laughs> that went out on a day, one of them was a brigadier and the other one was a colonel. They had no business being in that aircraft because the day before, they caught a disc around right one foot below the pilot in the door. That's a big, huge, preserved weapon round. It's bigger than our big cow even. But big hole, disc around, bullet was still in there. I thought, okay, it's gonna fly in the water in the daytime. They went out the next day because they wanted to see the battle area, assess what was going on, assess the battle damage. And they were shot down, no survivors who were born in that plane. Now, is that all the ammunition that was on that plane at one time? No. That's all it can carry. At Usually, one time? not at one time. Usually, you've no. got some. Because that says the 208 cannot carry that much. No, no, no. <laughs> you've, got, you've got some kind of recipe for the mission. So, you know, that I can need X amount of, of rockets. I'm going to need a couple of 500 pounders and I'm loaded. So, but, but that's the. That's the entire menu of what it could have done here. Rockets, flares, um, it's, it's a, it, it, you'd hear them all night long buzzing. If you go, they're pretty loud. And you'd hear those guys taking off. You just, you just roll over and say, get some of them. Go get some of them. So the way forward in Iraq, I'm going to kind of cut down to a couple of, uh, of solutions here because we've got the pocket of ISIS. What's going to happen in Iraq now? It, it's all a matter of 
education, governance, partnership, cooperation, uh, industry. The good news right now is the price of oil is coming back and, and Iraq has arguably the second largest known reserves in the world. So they're, they're going to be okay. Um, but you can see that we've been fully engaged on all these things that, and making sure the inclusion, uh, the councils, the region, every province has its own reconstruction, reformation, you know, uh, reconciliation council. They all, we're the ones that are leading the, the, the future Iraq. That's what they want to be, is the, the leaders of the future Iraq. So they're working hard to make sure that they're uh, including everybody's idea, all sex, all political process. Mm -hmm. They did work so well under uh, Norrell Mallory, I'll tell you. Yes, sir, who yes, sir. controls their bank and who controls their finance and who controls the flow of money? The, the central bank of Baghdad really is the official bank. And so when a, a barrel of oil, uh, and I don't know, which I got to double check, because as of a year ago, Every dollar from every barrel of oil was funneled through New York. It went to pay off pre-agreed debt arrangements. There were billions, billions and billions, and tens of billions of dollars of debt that was forgiven to Iraq. They were under such a burden of debt with Saddam's militarization, they could have never dug out from underneath it. But, but many of those countries, uh, you know, forgave the debt, and so, but they do have some legitimate debt. They got to pay that down. So. So that comes through to a controlling uh, bank in New York that, that siphons off some, uh, and the rest goes right to the bank of Baghdad. Then it gets uh, zeroed out to the central government. If it's going to uh, Kurdistan, they've got an 18% of the total budget. So they get about 18 cents on the dollar. Uh, if they don't sell their own oil, you know, we had a spat about that a few years ago. They wanted to have the cake and eat it too. And I love the Kurds. We want to sell our oil, we want you to make 18% money too. <laughs> and Iraq said, this is all Iraqi oil, you know, so you can't have both. You can have either or. Uh, but the, the provinces get about three, three cents on the dollar. <coughs> if you have a, a refinery, you get another nickel. So, you know, they're, they're kicking in about four and a half million barrels a day now. So it, it adds up quick. Well, there's a lot of uh, Corruption, or is it all pretty well auditable? Or so the the, the higher uh, who is just a he was kind of an unknown back in his election. You remember, nobody forecast him to be the prime minister, but he was an expat. He came from the UK, was educated over there, uh, came back to Iraq to, to help this country get back on track, uh, post bat party and all of that, and. Uh, He's an honest broker. He has declared war on corruption. He's probably put seven or 8,000 people in prison for different levels of corruption. Some have gotten the money they've ran, you know, in some cases millions and millions of dollars have gotten away. Uh, but by and large, now the most recent election and the prime ministership is sort of up. It looks like uh, Muqtada al-Sadr and Haider al-Abadi are gonna, their two organizations will join so they have a clear majority, in which case, uh, Hyder al Badi will stay as Prime Minister. Um, this would be his second term and last term. Muqtan al Sadr, uh, so I thought he was one of the guys we should have uh, taken care of back in 2004 when we had him held up down in the, in the Al Najaf Mosque um, with a couple hundred of his guys. The Marines had him surrounded. Wafak uh, al Rubai, who was the National Security Advisor went down there, intervened to counter to the Prime Minister Ayala Lawi's orders. But nonetheless, he went down there, got in between the Marines and Muqtada al Sadr, so he survived. Uh, and, and he's been an enemy of the U.S. He hates the U.S. He has hated the U.S. But he finally, I gotta tell you, I think the guy is finally <coughs> growing up a little bit. Uh, he's finally maturing a little bit into what his father was. And his father was a Huge hero of Iraq. He's one of the only guys, uh, Al Sistani and, and Al, and Al Sadr's father, the only two that would stand up against Saddam Hussein. So he's kind of growing into that role, uh, much more mature. The Iraqis are very hopeful for him, so that makes me kind of hopeful for him, not completely. I'm not ready to sign up with him or anything, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm going to whip through some more of these slides also so we can talk. You know, defense cooperation. Um, 
governance, the mentoring of the, the most senior levels of the government is still just as important as at the provincial, what we call kind of the county level. They need the provincial level as well. And there's a massive amount of, of law enforcement training and mentoring going on. Education. Uh, we had a pleasure back in 2011 of donating 3,000 laptops to the Ministry of Education. And we, this was down in Basra. We were handing out down there. And they, this was the Minister of uh, Education, uh, the Basra governor back there behind. But they were, I mean, everyone turned out for that. They had a dozen, which they had got in you know, all the Iraq you know, TV stations. But they were all there interviewing. And it, was a, it was very much a, a great experience. But education is key. You know, you find, a, you find an idea with what? A better idea. You prove an idea, like terrorism, to be a bad idea to show them there's a better idea. Why? Here's a great example of success in the Middle East. From 1990, what is it, 90 to 2013, so, what is that, 23 years, Dubai has been built. It looks like, hey, who knows has been to Dubai? Does it not look like an architectural contest? Absolutely. It's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. So 2007, 2008, 70% of the construction cranes in the world were in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Yeah. And they're still there. And they're still there. <laughs> and they're still building. It's crazy. <laughs> so can it be done? And, and the Emirates have not a fraction of the resources that the Iraqis have. Mm. And they don't even have a fraction of what the Afghans had if you start talking about natural resources and minerals. Get away from those doggone poppies, you know? That's just such a lazy uh, product to enrich the country and tax it. I, I, I wanted to touch a little bit on the, the embassy. We've been doing the, the renovation of the now old embassy in Tel Aviv. Uh, we got about another year to finish it. <clears throat> and we were meeting with State Department with Office of uh, Building Operations Overseas, OBO, uh, just a couple months ago. And, and it was when we were rumored to be moving the embassy. I said, what are we going to do? I said, y'all going to stop this project and go throw your money in? He said, no, no, no. Uh, we don't have the funding for the new embassy yet, uh, which is the consulate in Jerusalem. But what we're going to do is just switch sides. We're just going to take the sign off the building here, and they'll be, go over there and put it on the building, and Jerusalem take that sign off and put it up here. This is the new consulate. Uh, the ambassador and a handful of people are going to go down to Jerusalem, but most of the embassy staff is still in Tel Aviv. There's no room for them. So there is a plan to build a, a, a really a, a very noteworthy embassy. Um, we're watching for We just won the embassy, the new construction embassy in Sydney, which I think is going to be a lot more fun than building. <laughs> There's also a plan for, for a new embassy in, uh, um, in Tripoli. I really want to learn that one. Uh, and also in uh, Mogadishu. So and, and we got a contract now to manage all the airports in Mogadishu and help the military in Mogadishu. So that's going to be interesting hmm. work. My, my project manager down there says he has fallen in love with camel steak. <laughs> <laughs> he says it's as good as beef steak. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, I got to tell you, I, I, I will always be thankful for, for getting in and out of nine years, a little over nine years in Iraq and, and uh, reappeared in Afghanistan and, uh, and being here to share some of this. Uh, this. This was after my vehicle we got uh, shrapnel with hand grenades and what have you and paper with gunfire. This is my little driver. The next morning I went out and we were getting ready to launch out again and it had big crocodile tears coming down of his, out of his eyes and I said, Sergeant Johnson, are you okay? And he said, Sir, I just missed my mama, and I'm afraid I'm not going to get to see her again. I said, I promise you, you're going to get home. I guarantee you, I'm calling and give her assurance you're going to get home. We're going to take great care to not get attacked again. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I enjoy coming back and sharing uh, some, of those, some of those lessons learned over there. But I can tell you, we've got to remember the global war terror is global. There's a lot of organizations out there that hate us that have declared war on us and that are evil to the core. I, you know, I don't want to sound like a, a radical or anything, y'all, but uh, Edmund Burke said, the only thing for evil to succeed is for good men to do nothing. Uh, I would tell you, uh, 
I would call on us to get engaged. Stay up with what's going on and, and terror worldwide. Talk to your neighbors, tell your family, keep them up to speed. Talk to your legislators. Be sure that your voice is heard and that you're aware and up to date on what's going on, where we're winning and, and where the risks are, where the additional threats are. Um, it, it is a war that we need to win in our time. And we can't. Well, we've eradicated ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria. It's all but, you know, handful of it. Within the next 30 days, they'll be gone. And then the plan is the very unpublished, no timeline, you know, Commanders don't issue timelines. We're going to leave on this day. <laughs> yeah, we heard that a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exact day we're going to leave. So then they'll know when to attack. <laughs> and it's crazy. It's crazy, right? Uh, but we do need to stay engaged. We need to. And I tell you, I, I, I talk to a lot of church groups, and I, I had uh, young ladies and, and young people that will say, well, well, what can I do? I mean, I. I'm a student, what can I do? And I tell them, you can do the most important thing. Pray. Pray for all those soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines, all those young men and women that are out there all over, all over the world, deployed. I mean, pray protection for them. Pray for this evil to be conquered. Pray for us to win this global war on terror in our lifetime. We don't want to hand this down to the next generation. How about those of the public? Not the ups, a lot of the young. You know, uh, experts say it's not, it's not a question of uh, if will it be attacked again. The question is when. That's the real question. So how, mu how much of the dislike or hatred for the United States that others have is related or may be related to the fact that when we are present in their country, we seem to try to create a little America in their country as, a, as opposed to allowing them to determine their own fate. Okay, sir, you hit the nail on the head because, I don't know, maybe for 100 years we've made that mistake. We think that people view the world through our eyes, through the same, the same lenses that we have. Uh, and it's, it's, it's drastically, dramatically different. You know, that's the point you're making is, we, we've got to go in and be much more culturally aware, and be smart on their culture, smart on their history, smart on what they want. You know, for, for years here now, we've gone out in the hinterlands in and, and Afghanistan and built water wells and we'll take generators out there. Now you got power. You got the electricity. You can run a refrigerator. We're going to bring your refrigerator. <laughs> we come back two weeks later and they've torn that generator up. They don't want a generator. They really want to water well, don't mess with our water, you know? <laughs> so we tend to think that, uh, and we make the mistake over and over. And, and I so mean, it would be like, as I see it, we're concerned about Muslims coming to this country yes. and trying to impose Sharia law yes. over yes. my dead body. Yes. And, okay? and I, you don't tell the Americans how America is going to be run. That's right. But the reverse is also true. We right. can't go to Afghanistan and set up a little America. That's right. Go in there and say, okay, we're going to build churches all over and royals. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be a, it's got to be a natural, you know. If there's proselytization that happens, it needs to happen as a natural force. People need to. I mean, Jesus wanted everybody to decide. You know, he didn't. I recall, he didn't really break any arms to get people to become Christians. He didn't say, look, you're you're going to become Christians. <laughs> I just didn't do that. So you know, we shouldn't be here. The point is, is well made. One more, one more little point, I'm coming right to you, is during 2004 and 5, we took bad, fatal, fatal advice in completely running all of the bad party members out of Iraq. We disarmed the entire military. Well, actually, we didn't disarm them, take that back. So we fired the entire military, we fired the entire police department, and fired the entire uh, fire department. We sent them all home. No, so the unemployment went to about 70% overnight. But we stopped paying the retirements <coughs> to those people who had already retired to serve the country. Whoa. We sent them all home with their weapons. <coughs> and by late 2004, we had a full blown insurgency well armed. <laughs> Duh. Duh. Wonder how that happened. <laughs> 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 
expect to progress the North Korea and what's going on there in just three months? I got to tell you, I'm really excited about what President Trump is doing in North Korea. Uh, it is historic. I mean, think about that. No one has actually met with Kim Jong Un or Kim Jong Il uh, in, in, in the last in the history of North Korea since the Korean War. It's the first time it was actually been a set down discussion. And the first, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like walk, crawl, walk, run. I think that's what you know, the critics are not are not acknowledging that. You know, like oh, you sat down with him and that legitimized it. <laughs> you know, what? So how do you think we're going to win peace? You know, without without fighting. I mean, you do it by negotiation and, and give and take, and you get there. You get to peace. Um, they're pretty desperate, I think, to want to, to come to the table with us. The only thing I'm really worried about is our president is really attacking a lot of fronts at the same time. The tariffs are a big, big deal. And with our $200 billion of tariffs against China, I'm afraid China might well use North Korea's bargaining chip to get some relief on that. Uh, which may be part of the plan. That goes two ways. Yeah, it does. It goes two ways. And he's a real smart guy, so I'm not going to second guess him, you know. If, if that goes to $100 billion and we still get peace, hallelujah. That's fantastic. But our Marine Force, our combats, our Army, Navy forces, we're back up at par now. We're, 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 we're getting back up quickly under this president. We're not there yet, but we're getting there quickly. And we've got a sick man who, who General Mattis, that you know, I don't think anybody wants to, to uh, shove around the U.S. while he's in the job, or President Trump, or John Kelly, or, I mean, it's a, we've got an A-team in there, right? Yes, sir. And my son, uh, who's a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force, just spent six weeks part of the war gaming exercise in South Korea. He found that kind of boring, so my question actually is, so, uh, going back to that gentleman's question about Afghanistan, he's now going to be entering a 10-month EOD training program uh, in, at, uh, in Destin. Uh, because he feels that that's important to protect against soldiers getting blown up. My question is, his unit just got deployed to, to, and now it's to Afghanistan, so he have, he'll follow them when he gets finished. The question is, what do we want to accomplish in Afghanistan that's realistic? Can we really build a nation state, or do we have to learn from history that what are our alternatives as opposed to building a nation state so we don't continuously have our soldiers being sent over to Afghanistan for the next 10 years? Good point. Good point. Afghanistan's a completely different nut to crack than Iraq. Yes, in Iraq, Everybody's ambitious. They've been doing business every, historically, every family for their centuries, you know, centuries and centuries. They're they're industrious, they, and they've got massive resources, so they're going to make it. Whether they have our help or not, they'll make it. You know, there's plenty of others, China and Iran, and those that want to help them, Russia. They they love to move in and take and edge us on out of there. They love to, which I think would just be a grave sin for that to happen. But Afghanistan. You got two different Afghanistans. I gotta call it, you know, there's there's urban Afghanistan and there's the rural Afghanistan. And it's completely different societies. And so it's gotta be uh, I'm I'm really hopeful about these mullahs and these professors and these teachers that have formed this massive group, three thousand of them, to form this coalition, that they will look at inclusion of everybody take into account that maybe they need two different sets of laws. Maybe they've got to have the rule of law is one thing in the, in the built-up areas, and maybe in the rural areas, it's a little bit different. It's a little more tribal. It's a little bit, you know, it might be a little bit more Sharia law than you have in the urban areas. I don't know. But I think it's going to take some smart people really getting get the chips off their shoulders and trying to figure out how to make this thing work. They don't have the resources, so you don't have the whole book. And they, they've got a lot of corruption in their stuff, I agree. Uh, they've got a brilliant uh, gentleman who's handling their finance and their, and their economy, but he was just kind of pressed into service a year ago, uh, and with a 98% uh, approval rating, 98% mm -hmm. of the vote brought him in. He won, a, he won an award for State Department back in 2013 uh, for just jobs and, and building business, and I guess he was kind of a leading businessman in the country. But he gave all that up, walked away from it, uh, and is now in this government job that probably had a tiny fraction of what he was making. Wow. We'll thank, see. You. Yes. thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Yes. Good. Go ahead. Just one quick. Sure. Uh, what do you hear, Colonel, about the change in the rules of engagement amongst the ranks? Well, I, I'll tell you the one thing uh, about this administration is the war is not fought 
from the basement of the White House. The war is fought from the Pentagon, who completely delegates to CENTCOM, who completely delegates to the field commander. And so the field commander is super sensitive on rules of engagement in the field and actually when do you go weapons free? What constitutes that? And I can tell you our commanders out there, from, from Jim Mattis down, he is not going to lose one Marine soldier, airman, or sailor because they didn't have a chance to shoot first. He just not going to, he just didn't believe in losing Marines. You know, he'll take the hill. He'll he will pay whatever it takes to take the hill to win the battle. That's what that's what we do is win battle, win our nation's battles, our sailors and soldiers and airmen and marines. That's what they're that's what they do. Um, but he will not expend them needlessly or frivolously. So, that's a great Why do you go ahead, Amy? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that we need to study history and culture in the Middle East. Along the same line, in your view, what do you think is likely to play out about the isolation of Qatar in Sunni world? That's a very complex thing. People don't think about it. It is. I, you know, i got to confess, I, I'm not so up to speed on uh, Qatar. I, Qatar was a great partner with us during Desert Shield and Desert Shield. Tough guys. Tough guys. A lot of those guys, I mean, we would call them mercenaries, but they were Qatari citizens who fought the wars for their country for pay. When there wasn't a war, they sent them home. They had some kind of conflict or needed them, they came back. There's a threat to Iran. Those guys mobilized. And they were tough. Uh, but I don't know. I just I don't know the solution. I think that one thing that will happen is Qatar, Bahrain, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Oman, all those countries that are severely threatened by the Iran threat, the traditional Persian threat, I, I think that they're going to be, I think they're going to be reluctant to go too deep divide with each other because they need each other too much. They can't survive without each other. So I think at the end of the day, the greater threat is probably going to win out. Now they'll have plenty of their tips, but and this is a pretty big one for them right now. But I think it'll I think it'll get mended over at some point. I think reasonable for they this year. So you seem to be a proponent of American engagement in the rest of the world. You talked about we should have left the brigade in Iraq, you said we took our eyes off to the Arab Spring. You know, but there's another sign that says it's their country, it's their responsibility. Yes. You shouldn't mess with it. You know, if they want to fight, let them fight it out. Unless there's a security threat to the U.S. Okay, what would you say to that? Or do you think these situations will always ultimately evolve into a security threat to the U.S.? The winning engagement, um, I mean, 14 years ago in Afghanistan would have been we, we, the government's toppled. They all rushed off to Pakistan. They, they left the country all together with no government. Help stand up the government in that void of three years there that the Taliban moved in. We did very little to help them stand up their government. Mentor, rule of law, do all of that stuff that we're now doing, we're now working on in Afghanistan. But then get out of the way. Let them police themselves. Let them figure out how to work, make their democracy work. In Iraq, I'll go back to it, and I'm telling you, if we had not fired everybody back. So in World War II, what did, uh, what did they do with the Nazis that ran the electricity and the railroads and the water and the, the public utilities? And they went right back to work. They joined the Nazi party because they didn't have a job if they didn't join the Nazi party. They, didn't, they were not hardcore Nazis. They kept the country running. They stood up their own police. They stood up their own military. They were big. They were going to do the war criminals were all punished. Those guys were hung. You know, they got their just due, most of them. Uh, and the Mossad traced down the West, the rest. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I think that there's, there's just, we've learned so much. But you look like the history of World War II. I don't know if we would have been in Iraq after 2007. I think we would have been, maybe had a, a training brigade there. And to, which is what we needed in 2012. One training brigade to prevent an ISIS. <coughs> some U.S. Marshals and some FBI and some judges and some people who are there uh, helping train, teach, how do you run a court, how do you prosecute, how do you gather evidence, you know, how do you, how do you 
uh, enforce the law. I mean, we've had thousands of those guys over there over the last four or five years. But I think that should have been our, our full-blown effort by 2006 and 7. Should have had the Iraqi military be in the Iraqi military. Well, I thought, yes, I think they thought that the Iraqi military was able to handle all threats, and that's why they withdrew completely. Well, they could have. It was the trouble was is the governing council, 25 expat members that came back, very senior Iraqis, were so horrified of the bad party that anybody that had a bad party has been a member has got a, can't have a job with the government. Cannot have a job with the government. So there were hundreds of thousands of people who could depend on. Could remember you saw the the, the uh, museum being looted, <coughs> the jewelry stores being broken into, banks being blown up, and everything hauled out. You know how much going on over there? Well, we fired everybody. I want to name names back in the who thought that was a good idea hmm. back then, but it was a fatal, terrible idea. You haven't mentioned the conflict between the Sunnis and the Shiites, and now the Sunnis are mainly in ISIS. And ISIS consists of Sunnis. Yes. And the Iraqi factions, the Shiites, and how is that going to play out? Why do we care who wins that battle? You know we don't. <laughs> we don't. All we want to do is be sure. We want to be sure that whoever's in that DMC, the Parliament, is taking care of everybody. You cannot marginalize and isolate 10 percent or 15 percent of your population without some form of civil war. And that's what Maliki gave him. He began to marginalize the, the, the Sunni. And the Sunni capitalized on that. And the Iran capitalized on that. The ISIS came all the time. We do, you know, I get all the Sunnis here because you better join us because Yeah. All the all the Shia are gonna get you. Now they're gonna run, they're gonna take your family, they're gonna take your business, they're gonna take and I'll tell you that before we went in, oh, I was sitting one day with uh, the Sunnis getting what they deserve. Well, I was sitting one day with, I give you, this is kind of the sum of it, and because uh, I was worried about this. This was back when our media got all hyper about sectarian fault lines. Remember the fault line? That's that's a dream death of me. Fault lines in the country. It's a big crevice out there, and on this side there's Shia, and on that side, you know, there's Sunni, and uh, if they happen to cross the crevice, you know, it's going to be bloodletting, and it was the craziest thing I've ever heard. I've been there two or three years by that time. I'm like, what, what is I come home on R and R. And Ruthie and I, she's a big Fox News man, and I am too. But I would, box, I would watch Fox News and get mad. I'm like, where are they getting this stuff? And uh, so I was sitting one day, I was worried about this. And actually, General Casey had told me, go sit down with the National Security Advisor and talk to him. We need a battalion of special police to go up and clear out Al Qaeda out of Mosul. I said, yes, sir. I'm on it. You know, so, I had a meeting next day with him. I sat there, and the, 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 the most recent National Security Advisor, who was a dear, really dear friend, sitting here, and the Deputy Prime Minister and the current National Security Advisor had kind of become a four way. And I said, uh, General Casey wants to know, you know when you're going to be able to release uh, some of your special police that are out here in Aramadi, Fallujah, out in the area, because we need to move them up in that contested area. You know, it's sort of a contested area, and Mosul's here at the top, and here's our money, and here's Baghdad. And he said, uh, I keep cool, which is currently, I keep cool. Are you talking about what your media refers to as the Sunni Triangle? <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first, I thought, okay, mine field. <laughs> I could be on the plane tomorrow. You know? I said, I wouldn't characterize it like that, sir. I said, ah, media side, I said, I guess if you look at it on a map, it looks kind of like a triangle, but. But we just need to go to Mosul. And so the, the, the uh, deputy leaned over and touched me and said, uh, I can't even understand that the, the, uh, His Excellency uh, is the leading Sunni chief in all of Iraq. He's our deputy prime minister. I said, oh, you know, what did you say? I said, oh, sir, I said, such an honor. You know, wow. You know, <laughs> just get me out of here. You know, this is getting deeper. And he said, but he said, uh, but he's married to a Shia. His wife is Shia. And so the prime minister, he said, but you know Dr. Sapa is Shia, but his wife is Sunni. And all my lights are going on. I'm thinking, this whole sectarian thing is really a creation of the media. More than anything. That was taken advantage of with emotionalism, which is, I mean, that's all Al-Qaeda and ISIS. 
it is not a, 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 you know, a national security plan or a national plan that makes any sense. It's all emotionalism. That's what they recruit people on. It's rev them up, you know, tell them, convince them, you know, that they better join or, or, or else. You, you meant in your Yes, sir. Just one question. With ISIS being on in your prediction, do you have any comments about what happens with Syria, with Russia? So Russia announced two months ago that they're going to start withdrawing. I haven't withdrawn any in the last two months. <laughs> so we haven't either. We've got about 2,000 people in Syria in all forms and fashions. Uh, but after this pocket of resistance is wiped out, we'll start drawing back, no matter what the Russians do. But I'll tell you, the Russians have stepped in to save Bashar al-Assad. And he is one bad apple. Mm -hmm. He is as bad as Muammar Gaddafi ever was, and just about as bad as Saddam Hussein ever was. He's a bad apple. And, and the Democratic Front isn't going to just, you know, fold their tent, call up the hunt, go home. They're going to stay at it. And so he's, he's got a civil war on his hands. So okay. it'll be interesting to see what Russia does. I hope they live up to the word, but, you know, they the one discovered given the Crimea back. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned earlier, sir, we had soldiers all around the world. And uh, someone alluded to earlier that uh, we haven't hit our recruitment goal and a while down. Yeah. And how, what kind of strain is that putting on the forces, and how are they going to rectify that? How are they going to fix that issue? It's, it is a major problem. What you're, what you're, that we have had, uh, we had an immense strain on the military over the last decade. Uh, if you know, we don't have a reserve <coughs> unit or a guard unit or anyone that hasn't deployed, mobilized as much as anybody, as 101st Airborne or 82nd Airborne, 1st Marine Division or anybody. Every reserve, every guardsman has got as much time in the field as anybody else does. Mm -hmm. And they've gone and done great service. I'll tell you something, it's seamless. We talk about a seamless military, it really is seamless. Um, but, the, but we did a study back in the 80s on, on achieving longevity in the military. We said, you know, you've got to have a quality of life. You have, you have lots of problems that come out of too frequent deployments and too long deployments. Mm -hmm. You have marital problems. You have problems with the children. You have financial problems. You've got all kinds of stuff, substance abuse problems, that crop out of the, the, the mother or the father being gone too much. And so we found that the, the balance was one in four. If a service member, man or woman, was deployed one in four ratio, one year out of four, six months out of two years, it's sustainable. It's sustainable. You probably survey you know, almost anybody that's done two, three, even some have done four tours. I mean, it's, it's wild. Uh, and, and with very little, you know, well time in between. Because you, know, you got to come home, you got to be compressed, you got to kind of get, it takes a little bit to get back into society. And, and, and uh, okay, more? What? Yeah. Could you comment, Colonel, on Turkey and Kurds and what your thoughts are, what's going on there? But Turkey won't invade Kurdistan as long as it's part of Iraq. They just, they'd love to. They would love to. There is a so so on the border between Iraq and Kurdistan, you get the PKK, and it's a little bit like Kashmir between Pakistan and India. Uh, it's that contested area, and just over into Turkey, you've got a very large Kurdish population that lives there. So the cross border thing is a big problem for Turkey. I could argue both sides. Of I could argue for, you know, the, the uh, uh, Peshmerga, their view. I could argue, you know, the Turkish military are really good. They're just going to have to work it out. And Iraq is the, probably the best peace to be for as soon as they get well from the, the war of ISIS. Okay. So we give them a round of
My direct supervisor is our speaker tonight. So we go back 30 years. So really good. Quick convention update. Uh, platform, of course, everybody complained the platform was too long at 250 planks. Our new platform is 334. If you've never sat through a 30 minute discussion on hemp, you have not lived. Trust me. Uh, talk about the election. Our chairman now is James Dickey. James Dickey was, of course, picked by the SRC nine months ago. When Tom Meckler left, James did a great job. He won 22 of the 31 caucuses, won 66% of the vote. 
SREC turned over about 40% of our normal. We have two new SREC members in uh, Senate District 8. Chuck Branch and McKinney, McKinney City Council, was elected to the SREC. Replacing Carl Voigtsberger and Carl as your predecessor in that role. I appreciate the time you put in, the effort, and the sacrifice. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Our SREC committee woman is Susan Fisher. Susan's been involved in the Dallas County side pretty much, but for 40 years in politics and knows everything. Finally, new vice chairman, Amy Clark, is staying home. Her girls are teenagers. She has an 18-month-old. She's staying home to raise kids, which is great. Alma Jackson is our new uh, vice chair. Alma's specialty is outreach and engagement with the Hispanic community. It will be a great asset party. That's it. Thank you, sir. All right. When is our next meeting? August. And what's the date? Thursday, August. August. Yeah. Anybody got a calendar? <laughs> <laughs> right. One last thing. I, uh, who's brought in a new member this month? Look at the crowd. We're doing great. All right. But it's all, we want new members extend to your neighbor, their wives, and that's true. We're the traditional conservative Republican group of Collin County. I want to thank everyone for our attendance this evening. And Colonel, we thank you for your service. Thank you. Announce the uh, Welcome Home Veterans Luncheon next week. Announce it. You just announced that. You just announced it. What is Frisco, it? Right? Thursday, June 28th, First Baptist Church, Frisco. Come on, BJ. JB, and it's Welcome Home <laughs> Veterans. That <laughs> <laughs> goes along with Dubai being in, in Texas somewhere, right? And um, it? It's next Thursday, um, free lunch. First Baptist Church in Frisco, Welcome Home Veterans, and um, just go on to their website in RSVP because they are requesting that. All right, but no charge. But no charge, it's free. Right there. there you go. Should be good. All right, Any, anything else, we're good as over. Okay. Thank you all for your attendance, and we'll see you in August, and help us on the 4th of July parade. Thank you, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.